Good afternoon and welcome back to Catapult. This is the virtual lockdown salon program that we've all been enjoying for the last few months. And today I'm, I'm Natalie Urquhart from the Cayman Islands and I'll be in discussion with artist Nicholas Rose from Jamaica. Before we begin, I'd like to express a huge thank you to the Catapult partners for making this really inspiring series happen. Kingston Creative, the American Friends of Jamaica and Fresh Milk. And I've been enjoying these as a participant and obviously today very honored to be here as an interviewer. So feel free to ask your questions as we go through the next hour. Please put them in the comment section of the, um, the platform and we will definitely get to these nearer at the end of the conversation. And of course, subscribe to the Fresh Milk YouTube channel. So before I bring Nicholas on, let me tell you a little bit about who he is. Artist and educator, Nicholas Rose hails from Trelawney, Jamaica. He received a diploma in visual art from Myco College before receiving his Bachelor's of Arts in Art Education from the very prestigious Edna Manley College in Kingston. Nicholas lives and teaches in Manchester, and uh, which is just outside of the sort of buzzing cultural capital we often think of Kingston is where the art scene is happening. But it's great to know that Nicholas and his practice is thriving in rural Jamaica. He teaches both secondary and tertiary level education at VTDI and also the Northern Caribbean University. Nicholas is well known for using drawing and painting techniques on non-traditional surfaces. And we're going to see a lot more about that this afternoon, but also working in very large format, capturing the people and places of his surrounding environment very different from some of the urban work um, that we'll get to at the very end of the conversation today. He's exhibited and worked in group shows and solo exhibitions across Jamaica, as well as Europe and the United States. And he's the winner of several significant awards, which we're gonna hear about again. Nicholas also has a really significant online presence, which we'll discuss. And I definitely encourage people to go to NROSE Art Studio. Um, where his mission is to create and promote awareness of the contemporary arts stemming from Jamaican roots through local and international projects, exhibitions, commissions, collaborations, and outreach. It's my great pleasure to welcome Nicholas Rose. Thank you for having me, Natalie, and greetings to everyone joining us in our LVS online space. Thanks for having me. And I know you've been really active in catching all of these sessions. I see your name popping up a lot. So it's, um, I don't know about you, but I've been really getting inspired. Definitely, I'm excited about it. And we have a lot to get through today and I'm glad we were able to connect last week. So I got to know a little bit more about your practice. And I was reminded when I did that I saw your work twice in the two Jamaican um, biennials, Biennales in 14 and 17. We're gonna talk about, about that a bit later in the discussion, but it was great to know that I'd actually been able to stand in front of the work before we uh, had a chance to speak today. So that was a, a good, good reminder. Um, but I was really fascinated from our discussion last week about you as a young child in Trelawney in a very um, farm-based rural environment but finding your way to the arts in, in, a, in a place that didn't have, as you said, museums or galleries. Um, tell me a bit about how that inspiration kind of first sparked um, and how you then move forward to, uh, to choosing the arts and arts education as a career. Okay, no problem. I think it, it, it was natural for me um, and very inspired by nature because especially, you know, like now where we're having a lot of rains in, Trelo um, in Trelawney, around the island and the Caribbean, um, I'd always, you know, go by the, the spring and sometimes look out at the water and, you know, just the environment, the surrounding, the colors of the soil, um, the vegetation, just those things would always amuse me and amaze me. And I first sort of started art really when you know I saw some drawings that my father had there's this farmer's almanac which you know shows the different um, planting signs and so on and there were some you know European sort of caricature images on it and I would always try and copy them you know and it was very fun at times when you know I didn't have 
the books to draw from, I would just take, you know, a blank paper and just cover it with lines, just, just trying to capture, you know, aesthetics from memory and so on. And, you know, as you shared, there wasn't really any art space, gallery, any exhibition in rural Trelawney. I'm from a small community called All Sides in Albertown, close to Albertown, Trelawney, which is famous for, you know, the Yam Festival. It's a, you know, predominantly yam that's farmed there. Okay. So, yeah, um, it, I really saw art when I went on to high school at the Cartridge College. You know, I studied art um, and was taught by Miss Valerie Chotkan, very lovely teacher, who, you know, started to bring us to like art exhibitions, which at the time, you know, it was like the Mandeville Art Fair. So, you know, going to that, those um, exhibitions, I started to see that, you know, art is really a serious thing. But even then, I still didn't want to choose it because it was so natural. I really wanted to do science because I wanted to be a scientist like, you know, Isaac Newton invent something. But never knowing that, you know, in art, I can pretty much do the same. Absolutely. So, definitely. I went on from the cartridge to the Michael. And I had a very serious art lecturer too, Mr. Yuan Peart, who, you know, was like a father to me. And he always, you know, showed his paintings and, and has a lot of, you know, um, clients and so on. And, you know, right there, the first sort of encounter where I saw, yes, um, I could do art was we entered this World Skills mural competition. And that's when I got my first award. I got a gold medal for mural design it was a big show at the national arena. And, you know, following there, I went back, I went to teaching, but then after that, I went to the Edna Manley where there now, you know, I was exposed, not just to wonderful lecturers, but to wonderful artists. And two of those, you know, like Miss Prudence Lovell, Philip Thomas, you know, those persons were very influential, you know, in my, my practice and my studies. So at that point, I started now to participate into shows. The first one was the Mutual Life Art Fresh. And then, then I went on to the National Biennial, which was, you know, that turning point where I said, yes, um, this is where I want to go. This is what and I that, want to do for my entire life. That was my, life. my question. If you did have one of those aha moments, but in a way it sounds like that started at least subconsciously from a very, very young age. And I'm quite fascinated by this idea, even if we're not connected immediately to accessing the arts at school or in museums, if you're creative and that passion will out and you'll find a way to, to sort of get back on that track. Um, and I think we might have, I think Nicholas might have frozen on us for just a minute, are you back? I'm here. <laughs> yeah, okay, perfect, perfect. Um, so you're at Edna Manley, but you're, you're studying art education and you're continuing your studio practice while you're at Edna? Yes, I was. I, I, I've, I've been very fortunate. I think maybe it's just, um, you know, um, the way, um, the, my, the mindset I have. I've, I've always said to person, I'm first an artist and then an educator. Now that to me sort of make my life much easier when it comes to balance, balancing practice and, and teaching and also studying. Because even when I'm teaching, I always try to do, you know, most of the workshops, you know, where I can improve on my skills. You know, workshops put on by JCDC, those helped me. Um, I, I met Mr. Marty Mamak first and very good at drawing. And, you know, I've always been practicing, been, been building, and been researching and staying up to date with what's happening in the art and, world. And, and I think that's pretty much we, it. <laughs> but I think that's so critical, isn't it? I think we spoke last week about the energy that goes into teaching. And often with creativity, I, I know some wonderful art teachers in my own community. And they often say it's very difficult to continue having enough energy after they've been teaching and instructing to get back and really commit to developing their own practice. Um, 
And I think, as you said earlier on, it's the research, isn't it? It's continuing to learn and develop and setting those goals for yourself. Definitely. Definitely. I think that makes it easier. So I think we have a couple of images lined up, don't we? Um, it would be great to talk a bit about the development of your work going forward uh, through these images. So maybe if we could have the first of those. And I know, Nicholas, I think the, the couple of the earlier images that we're going to see are from that early biennial project or maybe before that. So tell me about this work. It's different from the other work that I've seen, which is much more illustrative, but on a very large scale. And here we have an abstract work. Is this a very yeah. early piece? Yeah, it, it was a little earlier than the Biennial. It's actually about 2013, 2013, yeah. So this was the piece that was pretty much the backdrop in um, work that was at the Mutual Life Galleries Art Fresh, where, you know, they featured, I think it was 15 or 16 of us as emerging artists across Jamaica. Um, this piece, you know, was really... Um, inspired by a feeling uh, uh, that I had um, where I pretty much felt a bit disturbed at, at you know, um, what was taking place in Jamaica. So I titled it Jamaica 50, Political Landscaping. At it, it, I think it was 2012 to 2013. Yes, yeah, so it was right after Jamaica was celebrating 50 years of independence. So I was also, um, you know, going through Edna Manley and, you know, my lecturer at the time was pretty much telling me about the island, places she visited and places I'd never went to. And I, I live here, you know, like um, Lika Ochi. So I was sort of envisioning an ocean in front of me. But then I started to be so expressive in terms of my line and the construction that instead of just painting everything all beautiful and lovely, I was saying, what are we celebrating really? Why, why are we create, spending a lot of money to put up all these colors when the most that I'm seeing on the news is like you're saying about the highways, things that were pretty much individual achievements. You know, I'm saying we're really we should be further with the, you know, the rich heritage and culture that's here. So it fueled me to create that painting and it's actually in a private collection right now. And, you know, it, it was the first sort of serious work that I put out that was exhibited nationally. And this is very large scale, is it as well, I think? It is pretty so this large. It's um, mixed media with, you know, collage, there's paint, there's charcoal. It's, it, it was so challenging even to move this around because it had a big glass in, <laughs> on it. But it was worth it. Absolutely. It's a very powerful piece. And I think it, it sort of, to me, kind of captures that turmoil in a way that you're discussing. In one respect, Jamaica making such great strides with this 50-year celebration but all of the questions around that and the challenges that you're facing as well. And I think you've really captured the spirit of that. And this was the first large scale piece because I know then you've gone on to really practice in large format. Yes, I think this was, you know, the first large piece. And then, you know, every piece that followed kept getting larger and larger. Should we look at the next work? I think we have, I think it's the, the piece that was in the early, Biennial, let's see if we can get the next image up on screen there. But while we do, while we wait for it, I did want to then move on to talk, you know, to ask you a bit about the actual um, base of your practice. We've talked about it being very inspired by drawing, um, but on large sort of in large format and on very non-traditional media as well. I know we won't talk quite yet about the piece behind you because I think we're moving towards that work, but it's... Um, I found it very exciting to see the experimentation that you were doing with what can be a very traditional approach to art, but in very, very different media on different scales and being very experimental because the power that you've created from that is, is really impressive. Thank you. And, you know, 
it's it's really the message that and and sometimes it's I've heard artists say it a lot and I've personally um you know experienced where the material sort of leads you. Sometimes you're working with one material, maybe it's canvas, but then there's there's the need to introduce something new, to introduce a, a, a different media just to, you know, get that desired outcome. Um, it started, I think pretty much all of my works are like that because personally, if I'm going to do a work and it has no significance or meaning, I'm not compelled to do it. Right. And in, sort, in, in order to bring out, you know, the, the message and the meaning sometimes, sometimes I have to push the work and pushing the work may mean using, you know, non-traditional materials or approaches to get that desired outcome. Um, but there's always, you know, some sort of meaning behind the use of the materials that I use. And I didn't mention, but the Jamaica 50 piece that was just shown was actually the first work that went international. Because following the, the Mutual Life Art Fresh, I then um, entered, um, it was an exhibition in Dallas, Texas. Texas, right. They just loved that work. You know, there was so much, you know, different meaning being derived from it. But, you know, I'm saying, whoa, you know, I it was my first sort of major abstract work, but I was saying, whoa, look at the, the response to, you know, me just giving out that emotion, you know? But it was, well, it's a very, it's a very charged piece, as you said. And then now this is, uh, this is a very different work that we've just uh, brought up on the screen. So the abstract, I know you've continued that in a way, but a lot of the work that I'm seeing on your website, um, there's a couple that are behind you that we'll also talk about, but a more representational in a sense. But as you say, it's beyond the rep representation because they are still very charged. And I think you are still forcing that sort of connection from the viewer um, that requires a response. And I, I'd love you to tell me a little bit about this piece as well. Definitely. And this piece is actually entitled Pentimenti, Miss Beryl. Um, and, you know, the word, you know, pentiment, um, you know, I think it's Italian, but it, it had to do with, you know, um, remnants or, or working, on, working on something, erasing it, keep, you know, sort of building on it. And I was approaching this, this painting, um, in that regards, in terms of color and drawing, as you see, a lot of the lines were pretty much left hard and, and you know, not rented in a, in a sort of um, clean or, you know, polished way. Mm -hmm. And it, it sort of just happened to be what I was trying to, tell the story I was trying to tell in terms of this character. This character, Miss Beryl, is actually, you know, a domestic worker who pretty much worked at my house, washed my clothes, you know, as a child. And pretty much I grew up, you know, having that grew up, having that respect and relating to her. And it made a shift in my work where you now start to see representation of figures, of, of archetypes from, you know, my local, my area that's rural Trelawney, because I felt like these persons, you know, their service is so important, so significant. And some of them go through life not being recognized, not being seen. You know, the world may not know of them because they're just in this small community um, and they're making certain contribution that pretty much mold a lot of us as individuals into who we are right now. So I decided I wanted to paint Miss Burial, but then my approach isn't all to capture a photographic representation of Miss Burial, but it's to capture that 
posture, you know, that, that energy, that, that, that mood, that um, monumental statue that she had, that, that she's very short and thing, but in the painting, you never know because of, it's just showing, you know, how much of a stalwart she was in, ter in, in, in terms of her contribution to the, the, the domestic work or the, you know, to the community. And it, you'll see, you know, more of that, more purses from my community in my pieces. Well, I think you've certainly captured her strength and there's a wisdom in her face as well. And as you say, it's not truly representational, it's more expressionistic, but that's a wonderful medium to sort of suggest that strength and that, that wisdom and the power that she has. Um, it's, it's a really beautiful work. And, uh, but quite a move yes. the abstract that we just discussed, so I'm fascinated by that decision to move from the abstract into these, these capturing these figures in this way. Um, but again, in the same way that you had with the abstract, you're, you're forcing a, an engagement with the viewer. There's no way that you can stand in front of Miss Beryl in a passive sense, I don't think. It's a very um, active uh, work and active relationship that the viewer has. Um, she's, she's, she's remarkable. Um, so we're going to move on to the next work because I think this is then we're going back to the the, the more traditional drawing but on the large format. Yeah, this is yes. uh, remind me of this gentleman's name because I love the story behind this piece. All right, so the first name he has is Melvin, but you know we we give a lot of alias in my community. You know we call him Bellos, and the la the latter name is Chronix. And, you know, at the time, Chronix, who is, you know, one of our young reggae singers, was doing remarkably things, remarkable things. So, you know, I said, I'm going to call this beat, put Chronix. But not only did I just put that name, I put Solidarity. You know, it's Trelawney, untitled, Solidarity, Chronix. And it's actually four panel papers four different paper and i think in in they were hung separately and it it's pretty much maybe about four by six feet in total and okay. i wanted to do more but then i was doing this piece for the 2014 biennial and you know at that time there was a size restriction but i think within this space or this frame that I, I worked on, I accomplished enough. Um, if you look close, you'll see that I captured, he has a machete on our machete under his arm. In the background, there's the fork leaned on the wall. And then, you know, to the, the other corner, there's the vegetation, you know, and, you know, again, I, I took the, a photo of him just seeing him pass through my, we call it our yard. So where our houses are, they're close by, there are track passes for where, you know, these farmers walk to their farms, what we call grown. So I just saw him passing and I'm saying, hold on, stop. And I took a photo and I was like, whoa, you know, I'm seeing these persons every day. And because I guess from a child, I've always been, not just seeing them, but I'm looking for, looking beyond and seeing visual aesthetics. I captured it in photo, but then I'm saying, no, I need to show this in a drawing, you know, and not only show it in a drawing, but in a large scale drawing. So similar to Miss Beryl, they were, they're kind of confrontational, but not, you know, um, in a harsh way, but the eyes, I always detail the eyes for to, to pretty much enable the viewers to connect with these works. So especially in the Biennial, there was so much um, wonderful response. And I believe that's when I decided I'm not going back in terms of my art. I remember uh, Miss Verlu Pupé, she called me at the National Gallery when I submitted this work because it was on four panels, paper. Um, 
she was like, how are we going to display this? What do you have in mind? And she was making suggestions to say, oh, I think you could use bulldog clips. You know, I saw this one of the artists in the States and it was lovely. And I'm saying, whoa, you know, to, to be this, you know, guy from way in rural Chilani and now connecting with the city and gaining such respect and appreciation for my work and appreciation indirectly for the people that I'm representing, you know, from these community or from my community was just remarkable. I think as well, just to touch on something you said about these not being passive characters, are they? It's, it's sort of giving a moment of pause in the viewer to, to respect and, and acknowledge the work that is going into these roles. And it's almost like touching on an art historical connection. You think of some of the European painters like Van Gogh and, and, and Gauguin bringing these characters to the forefront. Um, but I think you, you, you take that a step further with the scale and the sort of the power that comes with that scale. They sort of demand respect and demand you to pause and interact. Um, and I do remember seeing this in person. And uh, when you're in a biennial, it can be very challenging as a curator as well. You've got so many different types of artworks. I think this is when Ebony Patterson's car was in the middle of the foyer of the gallery. And you know, there's, there's, there's huge and very loud artworks. To present a drawing, even on this scale, it's uh, the success of this piece, I think, really speaks to the power of the scale and your choice to approach the subject like this because uh, drawings are often very quiet uh, and could maybe get lost in, in the, the louder works inside the biennial. And this really stood out uh, to me at the time as well. So congratulations. And it does sound like it was a real turning point for you. It was, thank you. <laughs> thank you for those comments. And did you tell me that this traveled or was that the, that was the next Trelawney piece? Because you said something when we spoke about. That was the next piece. Okay, but we'll touch on that. Actually, yeah, this actually did some travels, but locally, because it went okay. from the National Gallery. There was a request for it to show at this um, smaller space, but it's a pretty nice space. Um, it's called Grosvenor Gallery. Um, Douglas Reed is the, the curator and owner, and you know, he he saw it at the gallery and, you know, requested that I share. He was having another show and I brought it there. And, you know, that was also a wonderful experience. So it did some shows, but um, more local on the local scene. OK, and is this still in your collection now or is this as a, to a private collection? It's still in my collection right now. OK, OK. So let's, um, I think we're going to move on to the next piece and then we'll start talking a little bit about the present moment and, and your experiences of a lockdown. I'm really interested um, to hear more about that and how your own professional practice has been expanding in the lockdown moment. Um, but if we can bring up the, it's Wingy is coming up next, right? This is the piece that you're sitting yeah. in front of now. Okay, let's see if we can bring this All still right. up. So this is then really taking that idea of your, your sort of rural experience, the characters in your day-to-day -day life, but almost translating that into what seems to me to be much more sort of urban in its execution using um, the tarp. Tell me about this work. Yes, so um, you pretty much, you know, said a lot about, um, you know, the, the drawing a while ago. The, the chronics, which pretty much led to this one, where you know you, you were saying that it's I was very successful because it's a drawing can be lost. And again, as I say, one work sort of just prepare me for the next. Um, so this piece, I still wanted to put drawing. I have been, you know, creating works that are you know, predominantly drawing elements for a reason, because I believe, you know, I'm connecting with, with, you know, my past, my roots. And I think drawing or lines 
sort of, you know, sell that message or present that message the best way. But this piece now, it's called, it's a Trelawney untitled, just the same, but I put the name Wingy. And I decided to do it on tarpaulin. I felt like paper was, you know, one that I was successful at that. But I wanted to, you know, try different material. But then I wanted materials that would, you know, speak more than just, you know, the traditional paper. Because all around Jamaica, we use tarpaulin so often. I'm not sure about the Caribbean, but if you go to the markets, they, they put their produce on, on tarpaulins. If there's a leak, if over cars, it's everywhere. And it's this material that's known for its strength, right? And I wanted to represent the strength of these farmers. These farmers are not even say the traditional looking farmers that you would see with a banana on them head and stuff. These are young farmers, you know, which have never been painted or drawn or put in galleries. Mm. And for us, for, for persons to be farmers now, it's uh, very difficult. And, and I think it's since the pandemic, you know, since you mentioned it, that there's this growing appreciation for farmers. Because, you know, the, the, the value of, of foods and vegetables have produced have gotten so high, you know, and a lot of persons have lost jobs. And, you know, it's just really the farmers who, you know, are still, you know, have a stable job per se. So a lot of persons have been setting up, you know, their backyard garden and so on. So the microphones, I definitely yeah. wanted to show the strength and the value in this piece. And, you know, that's why the material was used. I used, you know, a variety of lines. I, 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 I tried to bring in the landscape in my pieces too at some point. And, 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 you know, I introduced color in this one because I felt like, you know, I had to do that to work into this material for it to stand properly and to, to, to sort of, be read visually in the way that I wanted it to. And I think, ironically, I took a picture of this friend, um, Winji, when I was actually going to the National Biennial, the 2014 Biennial. And then, so I was driving past him in the community and I'm saying, you know, I'm going to the National Gallery. He was going to his farm and I stopped the car and I say, you know, wait, I want a photo of you, you know? <laughs> and I'm going to draw it, I'm going to paint it, and I'm going to bring you to Kingston. I'm going to bring you in these gallery spaces. Because, you know, as I mentioned, Miss Beryl, I mentioned um, Chronics, and I'm now I'm mentioning Wingy. There are persons in rural Trilly, who are, Trelawney who has never, you know, went to, gone to Kingston or never traveled because, you know, you know, my father is one, a, a person like that, pretty much never traveled. Then they're just in their farm every single day, you know? So I believe, you know, I could make a difference by capturing the photo. And then, you know, years had passed because I did this painting um, or, or this drawing about 2016 to the 2017. And then it was in the... Jamaica Biennial, because the National Gallery has sort of changed the name. And, you know, that again got a wonderful response. And in fact, when I went and I saw where it was exhibited in a room, you know, with um, Omari Ra's work, and then somebody was bringing to my attention, hey, Omari Ra was the only artist who had worked on tarpaulin material, I think in the late 80s when he painted, you know, this African warrior and showing the strength. And I was saying, whoa, you know, there was so much connections being made and so much respect and appreciation for the work. You know, next door was um, Xavier Houghton, who was a young artist who was, you know, pushing his work also, doing a wonderful installation. And, you know, just to see it within that space, you know, hats off to the curators. <laughs> And so on, because, you know, um, that really moved me and, and changed my life in 
you know, how serious I take my art now. Well, and I remember that show and, you know, you, you referenced earlier on some of your mentors, like Philip Thomas, um, being very much visible at the biennial as well. So it must have felt very. Um, pretty amazing. And then I think in 2014, we had talked offline about other inspirations that you have, like people like Sheena Rose, who happened to be an yeah. invited artist in 2014, which is when I met Sheena. And that was a, another really inspiring show, I think, not just for Jamaica, but for practitioners like myself, a curator from a small, very small island, Cayman Islands. Um, you know, there were pretty remarkable projects in terms of the reach that the Caribbean can have um, if we collaborate more. And uh, I think that uh, I do remember them both being very inspiring too. And the piece, um, uh, Winji, that traveled as well. Did, is this the yeah. one that traveled to Europe? Yes, that was the same piece. It, it, it traveled to UK first and then to Venice. Um, so it, it, it went, you know, I was not just showing now in Jamaica, the US, but now in the UK and Europe. It traveled and, and I tell you the, the response you know, in Venice was fantastic because I didn't know, even know persons knew about rural Jamaica, but they were, I believe at the time, there was the, the, the Bob Marley documentary that was released. And you know, the image at the beginning was showing St. Anne's, the hills, right. the rural area. And they were saying, whoa, it reminds me of the real roots of Jamaica. You know, the, 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 the parts where Bob Marley came from and they, they started to make mention of that. But um, just to touch on some of those inspiration, trust me, um, Sheena Rose, would, who, you know, I, I, be, I met online first, <laughs> you know, and then we started calling each other namesake. She extremely serious, you know, has a wonderful presence in the Caribbean. Also Ebony Patterson, who at, I think all of these exhibitions, we always, you know, met up and, you know, looking at her roots, knowing she, you know, hailed from Stewart Town, which is close to me. We had that connection. She's always giving me um, support and encouragements, pointers. Although, you know, they're in, you know, in the US, they, she always sought to give me encouragement. Um, and I didn't mention, but in 2020, I was so fortunate to go on some tours to Barrington Watson's house where it was, you know, in his latter part of, you know, his, his life where there was a retrospect exhibition put on by the gallery. And I had yeah. some face-to-face -face talks, you know, and he, I believe, you know, is the, the most serious artist I've ever met. And where, you know, he said, you know, if, if, if I can't pretty much do art, there's nothing else I'd want to do, you know? And it's the only thing that we can do up until retirement. We can do art to our last breath. You know, even in our sick bed, we can be doing art and we can look at Frida Carlo, artists like that. And, you know, it sort of really allowed me to look at art in a serious way to say, this is my career. This is the path I'm going to take. And I'm really interested with this. Um, we touched upon it before, but the way that you negotiate the rural and the urban and the local and the international, because your website speaks very much of you as an international artist, sort of psychologically, but with Jamaican roots. So tell me a little bit about moving between those two spaces, because your work, of, you know, reflects that. In very big, but teaching in Manchester and then going into Kingston for these, the bigger art exhibitions and shows, very different experiences. So how do you negotiate those? And is it maybe very positive that you're able to then leave the urban behind and have this uh, kind of ability to kind of regroup um, in a, a more rural space? Yeah, well, the experience is, is challenging. It is, you know, um, just moving locally, you know, because um, Trelawney, you know, to, to, to Kingston at one some point, you know, it's like three hours ago yeah. there. An exhibition while you know persons could gather after I had to be journeying back 
Um, the climate in terms of art is different also, you know, and in Mandeville, it's also different. Mandeville, there's a lot of art fear, where it's more commercial art, where, you know, in Kingston is where you, you see more gallery works and more um, appreciation for art. But I think that's what really allowed me to look at my work in an international way because I've been very versatile. And then the connection in terms of, you know, influence is that when I do travel, you know, even in Europe, there is sort of rural space, you know, there is, you know, that similarity and, you know, these the artists there you know show different spaces and i you know believe that it's sort of a responsibility for me as an artist from a rural space to represent you know my space you know my landscape the people there and and not just to represent it in 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 Chilani or in mandeville or in kingston but globally you understand because there are persons out there in different countries who are having the same connections when they, you know, stand in front of these pieces. So I think it's, it, it is challenging, but as I say, it's worth it. And it's a beautiful thing to see, you know, persons connect with these pieces, although, you know, it's from, you know, a different um, background and so on, but there are similarities. And I, before we wrap up today, I do want to, to, to not quite yet, but touch on this idea of what other infrastructure do we need going forward to help support more artists move around more and make those international connections? Because I know you do most of this yourself. And we talked about how difficult and time consuming that can be looking for these opportunities and, and having to wear both hats as the art manager, administrator, and the creative. Um, but we'll get to that at the very end because I know we're, we're creeping up on time. I did want to talk to you about um, the project that you did just before lockdown, um, Project 119, and or was that during lockdown? This is about the, the recent the, the, the gun amnesty in Montego Bay that we were talking about offline last week because um, I think we also have another image of that work to come up. And what I'm fascinated about by the work, which I'd love to hear more directly from you, is it's designed to invite the audience to participate and how this moment of social distancing and lockdown is forcing the evolution of the piece and what that might look like if it goes digital going forward. So let's get that image up on the screen if we can. Um, and I think we actually have someone up there interacting with the work. Yeah. So, so Nicholas, tell us about the uh, tell us about the work. Yes. So, this was my first studio exhibition, and by studio, my the studio was started with some of my students at the Manchester High School. Um, they're they're on the website also. You know, students like Javon Turner, Alexi. Um, Georgia, these were um, Fisher, Bennett, just some really um, strong students, some very creative students who we pretty much was just having a discussion about, you know, the gun violence in Jamaica, that it's getting out of hand. And even now during the pandemic, we're still hearing about the gun violence. And now, um, especially in other parts of the world, you know, in, in, in Africa, we saw, you know, some episodes, you know, the other day, some, some, a lot of things happening in the U.S. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of countries are now sort of thinking about, you know, their gun laws and what need to happen. So just, you know, discussing with the students, we decided um, we could do a body of work. And then, ironically, there was this big Gleaner article that said 119 guns were destined to Jamaica from Florida. It was a big gun bus. And then I'm saying 119, 119, that is the call for crime. You know, let's name the project 119. So it's project 119. And it was right after coming from Italy. Um, 
And on returning to Jamaica, I, ha I got a Governor General Award for, you know, contribution to art and leadership. Congratulations. Um, you know, I am active in, 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 in church. I'm, you know, youth coordinator in school. I'm the coordinator for art club. So I've always thought I ha feel like I have this responsibility to youths because I think mostly youths are being victim of crimes, you know, um, especially gun related crimes. So we decided to name it Project 119 and the tagline was let's get rid of the guns. So we did um, some paintings which you're seeing to the left um, about, we, we had nine pieces in all. One was an audio installation, audio video. Um, and then there was an audio which was mixed down of, you know, songs which were gun related. And then we had paintings, and that is one on the left of Popcorn, which is, I think, one of the most popular Jamaican dancehall artists. So there was a lot of talk about, you know, the dark dancehall artists doing so much gun lyrics and so on. And I wanted to present, you know, these big drawings. Um, they're drawing on canvas, you know, but there's mixed media, there's charcoal, there's a bit of paint, and then this back, red background. And then there's landscape, but I put the map because, you know, I went to this session and it was so funny how, you know, they talk about the landscape affecting how, you know, the police and so on fight crime. So I put it, you know, it was a map of St. Thomas. There were other artists like Alkaline, Tommy Lee, Bounty Killer, Vibes Cartel, but those images aren't shown. Um, and then the piece to the right now is the main panel, which is a big... Um, canvas with the map of the US, which is where most of the guns are said to come from. And it had, I think, like a lot of drawing, like pencil drawing, like to represent like 119 guns. And then what persons do who visit the show, they went up and they could erase and they wrote on it, you know, persons they knew who died in gun violence. And it, it was so touching so moving uh, when I shared this idea with I shared it with Philip Thomas I shared it with Onika Russell and she said no, no Nicholas this is not just an art show this is art activism you know Absolutely. so I yeah. had reach out but I don't think this show had gotten the audience it, it, it needed right before you know the pandemic and all there was a lot of work going on on the roads in Kingston, Kingston. so I'm hoping to know create a, a virtual show for it. And after the pandemic, pandemic, hopefully I can now take it to different space because there were requests to take it parish by parish because there, you know, there's a flare up at times in Westmoreland, in Montego Bay. And I believe persons need to see and know of these pieces. The gun that you see on the floor, persons who come to the show could take up the gun. There were some clay, they were made modeled from clay but then you can take them up and dump them. There's this barrel at the at a position in the room. And you know, that's what they, they said a lot of the guns come in. So they take them up and they dump it in it. And they could write on the barrel to a lot of persons wrote, you know, to destruction and all sorts of things. And it was so fascinating. You know, some of my lecturers were even there and they were saying, and I didn't know that some of them lost relatives, one of them husband died because of gun violence. So I think this piece is, you know, a very um, serious work, um, body of work that needs to be shown more. Needs to be sure seen. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the questions that you and I discussed was there's been so much um, positive development in the digital realm for um, sharing work in lockdown. We've sort of been we've been forced to adapt very rapidly. And of course you were computer tech savvy long before I was, but it's allowed us a much larger audience in many ways. But then a piece like this, work, the, it's, it's the um, moment of catharsis, catharsis is to go up and write the name of your loved one or to take the clay weapon, as you said, and make that sort of pledge or take that action of putting it in the barrel and being part of the solution to the, this, this, huge problem that's a local problem but again a local problem for you that also resonates with the global problem that so many people are facing right now so I really hope that it's moved in person to multiple spaces 
because it's a very healing um, healing project. Um, so online is one thing, but that's really where we get to that question of how how art is experienced and whether the online version is enough. Um, and in this case, I, I feel very strongly that it needs to be seen in person and, and interacted with. It's almost like a culmination of the earlier social, socially activist work that you, you've been doing has come to this moment. Um, and I'd love, I do hope I get to see it in person myself one of these days too. Uh, Nicholas, we had so much more to talk about in terms of what you've been doing online. And I do recommend people go to NRO's art studio because all of uh, Nicholas's blogs, the new website is up. I know you've been working very hard in professional development and registering your company during lockdown. So making the most of your time. But we do have a couple of questions and I don't want to miss those. So um, we'll put a hold on the digital development, encourage people to go and see it for themselves. And uh, so a couple of these, a, a great question. Um, where did I see it? Oh, well, let's just jump into the ones on here. Do people in your own community get to see your work? The people that are in your work, so I would say as well. Definitely, definitely. Um, in fact, the moment sometimes I, I, I return from you know the opening of these exhibitions, I'll, I'll show them the, the picture of the piece, I'll, I'll show them persons viewing it, I'll show video and so on. But I don't think they've really experienced it in this gallery space. And I hope you know one day to pretty much have an exhibition in Trelawney or you know have a situation where. I can bring them to the space. But as I say, it's a distance away. It's distance away. And then these persons are normally you know, in their farm, in their domestic work, and pretty much, I would say, don't have the time or reach there. But I was going to say, it's the time, I, yeah. I, I, yeah, but I do bring the images and so on for them to see it. It would be great to see a project like um, Project 119 sort of take over some historic site or, you know, a space or even a large barn. You know, there's, there's multiple ways that it can be adapted in, um, in these non-traditional environments for contemporary art. So I, I want to see that happen. Um, let's go to another question. Um, I know there was one question earlier on about, are you ever going to open your own art school or art space? That was a question earlier on. Yes, um, from Leroy uh, Firon. Do you plan to open your own art institute? Well, definitely, but in a way, a bit bigger than that, you know? Because the, the, right now, you know, I, I do some private tutoring and, you know, persons call me for consultations and so on. But I, I hope, you know, this, the dream is to have this big art building, you know, like a, where where... There's not just the institute, but I want to always be practicing. So I want to have the institute, but I want to have an era for painting, an era for drawing, for fashion, for that, because I really believe that there's remarkable talent locally and also in the Caribbean that, you know, at times is not seen enough by the rest of the world because, um, you know, distance and so on, it's, it's mostly... Local, local artists based overseas that their work is shown, but there's a lot going on here most times. So, of course, definitely hoping to have, you know, own institute and so on, but I'm always going to balance it with production. It's like that, the, the model of a hybrid space, I think, is so exciting. If you have studio spaces where people are practicing and, and producing, and then exhibition spaces and the education spaces too. I think that would be a really exciting model to see. So that energy is just kind of cycling back into itself constantly. Um, and it sounds to me like you are the man to do that without a doubt. Um, let's take another question. Um, we have wonderful comments, Nicholas. I hope you are looking at these comments. Um, lots of really, uh, really supportive um, statements, which speaks a lot to you and your, your practice and your teaching. So, uh, Leroy, again, how do you plan to make art more widespread and appreciated among our youth, so the youth in Jamaica? And you're already working with a lot of young people as a teacher, and 
in a project like Project 119. How do you plan to take that even further? Well, I have been doing it. Um, as you know, you said with, with, with the students, with, with, we've done a lot of art competitions. I think, you know, over the past five years at the schools that I teach, the, the students are far more engaged. The passion has grown for art. And I'll pretty much just be continuing. I think the point I'm at now is the website. So I encourage persons to go to enroseartstudio.com and all the social handles um, spaces is the same Enrose Art Studio because that's where I'm heading now to sort of put other students, other persons work on that space. Although it's my website, I hope the next plan is to every now and again um, to expose an artist on that from my community, whether the rural space or from you know institution that I teach. So I've been doing it and I plan to go further. Persons just have to be keep in tune. And I jumped on it myself and I, I agree. I definitely recommend people check it out. And, you know, there is so much opportunity in the digital realm to at least introduce people to the work that you're doing and to showcase the students. I was really, really delighted to hear that too. I'm going to take one more question because we do want to do a kind of a wrap up as well. Annalie Davis says she really loves the use of tarpaulin as the base for your paintings. This material makes me think of crises. That's when tarps come out in the region. Is crisis something that you, you consider? And I know your climate change um, is, is a subject that you're looking at and tackling. And of course, even working in your community with farmers, it must be very much at the forefront of people's minds. And yes, to Annalie, yes, it, it, the tarp, yes, is the start of, you know, that discussion. It, there, there is a sort of crisis because um, where I'm from in Trelawney, we had to pretty much be um, campaigning, advocating for the past maybe two, three years to save the cockpit country, which is, you know, pretty much, you know, a sacred space, you know, in, in Trelawney and the region in terms of our water, our flora, our fauna. So there is that crisis, you know, with, um, you know, this climate justice and so on. And, and it, I'm, I actually have a series that looks at that. So, of course, creating these figure works. And as you see with, you know, Winji, all the others, there is images of, you know, the landscape in the background. It shows, you know, my appreciation. To, so to see, it, you know, being destroyed or other things. I'm troubled. So I've done a body of work, which are small scale, which I'm hoping to do, you know, maybe 50 or so paintings of the rural landscape of the cockpit country. I've also done one series that's called Bauxite Aesthetics, which showing the lands that were destroyed because of mining and putting those work together for persons to really come to grips and say, this is what's happening. So of course, um, I'm affected by that. I'm, con I'm con um, concerned and I'm working. I have bodies of works on that. So they'll be posted soon, keep in tune. On that website. So go to Enrose yeah. Art Studio. Another plug there. I can't wait to see those two. Um, something we all as, as people living and working in the Caribbean uh, is at the forefront of all of our minds. The pandemic is one thing, but the season, the hurricane season is all around us. We just dodged a bullet in Cayman with the um, a couple of storms that directly affect you in Jamaica as well. So we're so geographically sure. close um, that very much at the forefront of our minds. But I think we are about out of time, Nicholas. We have so much more to talk about. Maybe we can do a part two one of these days. But Maybe. sum up for the audience, your, your, your practice and, and, and the what next briefly. Tell us where you're going now that we're moving out of uh, out of lockdown. Well, at, you know, at the moment, as I say, a lot of work being done, you know, with online space, a lot of planning, you know, being taken place. Of, I registered in Rose um, Art Studio. I haven't posted a lot of images because when I start posting, I want to know, you know, be able to put up prints and all of these. So moving yep. forward it's really to be up more into the online space so that persons all over the world can connect 
to the works of Enrose Art Studio. And the work, as you've seen, will just continue to be getting bigger, to be getting more interactive, so that when this pandemic passes and you know the place open up, God's willing, you know, we were optimistic and looking forward to that. I hope to be able to be showing in the, in the Caribbean and so on. I'm so grateful for what Catapult has done because I think it, you know, has bonded us closer as a Caribbean community and family that I can't wait to, you know, be showing the works more, you know, in the Caribbean and all over. And that's such a great, great wrap up. Um, Catapult really has experience I think for all of us involved and um, I don't have the numbers of how many different countries and islands have been uh, part of this virtual salon series but also the residencies um, the teaching component because of course there's professional development opportunities for artists to engage in as well and uh, we are so grateful I think to the catapult organizers creative kinks or kinks and creative we've got um, American friends of Jamaica and of course fresh milk Annalie and Catherine are in the chat today. Big shout out to the two of them as well for all the amazing work that they're doing. So Nicholas, it's been such a pleasure and I hope we'll continue talking. I can't wait to see the next series. Um, I do wanna remind everyone, if you have further questions for Nicholas, jump on his website at Enrose Art Studio. I know he will love to interact with you. We have a couple of great questions about inter integrating technology from Leroy again. So a few of those can go directly to the website. Um, I do want to remind everybody to sign up for Fresh Milk's YouTube page and also to join the Catapult team again. I understand that next week is the last week. So, Nicholas, we're almost helping see the end of these conversations in, which is, yeah. they've gone by so quickly. Um, yeah, next week, so true. yeah, and I think you've been probably present at the majority of them, which is really impressive. Um, but on Tuesday the 17th, we've got the wonderful Alex Martinez Suarez from Dominican Republic, who will be in di dialogue with Lima San Fiorenzo from Puerto Rico. And then again at 4 p.m., Samuel Sarmiento from Aruba. So please um, dial back in to see the final week next week of Catapult Virtual Lockdown. Nicholas, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful. Thank bye, you everybody. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.